flying this airplane is what I always thought being a pilot would be. You know, you get up there and there's just levers and pulleys and switches everywhere and uh, you're, you're high up off the ground and you start that engine up and the whole thing shudders to life and you smell the, the oil and the av gas and the, the hydraulic fluid and she's just shaking and rattling and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm flying a freight train. You know, it's like this is a steam locomotive in the air. So it was purely accidental that I found the airplane. Um, I was actually driving home from ground school for Republic Airways. I got off the highway in Columbus and started backtracking my way to Pittsburgh. And I came, it was like two hours later, I came through this little area. And it said Beach City, Ohio, and I'd never heard of it before. I'll never forget seeing the sign for the airport. And then there was a row of open air hangars. And then at the end of that hangar, I saw the tail of this thing. And it was this silver rudder with a white vertical stabilizer and it was all torn and tattered. And I looked at it and I was like, is that seriously a DC-3? And came down the road and sure enough, there she was sitting there and just the most pitiful looking DC-3 you've ever seen. Just mold and fungus growing on it and all kind of dirt and debris all over it. And the windows were all delaminated and frosted over and tires were rotting into the ground. And I mean, my heart just broke, but I was like, holy crap. Like, so I pulled my truck over and I went over and just walked around this thing and was looking at it. And I was like, how can this just be sitting here rotting away like this? I remember walking up to the airplane and I don't even know why I said this, but I said, I'm going to do something to save you. You deserve more than this, I'll be back. And I remember giving the prop a hug and just like walked to my truck and I just kept staring at it. The owner did not want to sell the airplane at all. I finally figured out who that was, got in touch with him. And I, I asked if it was for sale or if he'd be interested in selling it. And he said, no, it's not for sale, not at all. I must have kept after him for three or four months, just calling and, hey, are you sure you don't wanna sell this airplane? Like, what are you gonna do with it? It's just sitting there rotting away. And he's like, well, what are you gonna do with it? And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to restore it and fly it. You know, I, I think that's what you wanted. And I said, I just need you to give me a chance. He said, I'll, I'll sell it to you for $100,000. And I said, I, I can't give you $100,000 right now. I don't have it. I said, I've got $25,000 to my name. He's like, you give me the $25,000, i will give you a year to come up with the rest. So that was the deal. I, I gave him every penny I had. I literally went broke in a day. Like I had nothing. And, but he had my money and I had one year to come up with the rest of the money to get this thing. Or he kept this and my money. I uh, went to work. I, I formed a 501c3 nonprofit. And then I went to work on trying to fundraise. And I went to every business I could think of, every person I could think of took us almost a year to the date. I was getting really nervous because it was coming down to the wire. But about a month or two before that one year, I uh, came up with the remaining money and we paid cash for this, which was a great day. But now I owned a DC-3 in the middle of nowhere in Ohio that hadn't flown in 20, <laughs> 24 years. So now it's like, okay, well, how are we gonna get this out of here? There wasn't anything on this airplane that worked at all. You know, we were afraid that the engines weren't even going to turn over you know but after having about three or four experienced people look at it saying you got a good airplane here and it just needs woken up you know there's nothing wrong with these engines it, it was the confidence i needed to hear to make that work you know we kind of put a game plan together of what we needed to do to get it flyable and um we just you know part by part started knocking those items off the checklist and the whole time while we were doing that I was fundraising money and going to every business and person I could think of that might be able to help us out and ask for help. It took about four years uh, to the point where we could ferry it here. It didn't hit me until halfway through the, the post-restoration flight that we were flying it. I, I was so focused on just every aspect of being a good test pilot at that point, you know, sticking to engine parameters and temperatures and, and watching everything that it wasn't until I think our second or third lap around the airport that it actually hit me that I could just sit back and it's like, well, we're actually flying, we're flying it and it's done. Like, you know, it's, it's restored. We did what we set out to do. And all the research we did on the airplane, 
uh, never had a name. So I always called the airplane, you know, the baby. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go out and work on the baby this weekend and stuff. And uh, somebody, I forget who it was, uh, just said, oh, the Beach City baby. I was like, man, that has a really cool sound to it. So I said, you know, we really ought to paint some nose art on this thing and, and give it a, a, an identity. And that Beach City baby name kind of stuck. So Chad Hill stepped in with Django Studios and Chad said, why don't I do a period era correct pinup, but make it to the likeness of your, your fiance, Emily. So I asked her and she was all for it. So Chad used a picture of her face and, and went to work and that's what he came up with. And we fell in love with it immediately. We're like, oh, that looks perfect. Uh, whenever we go to these air shows and different events, just like every other warbird, you know, uh, other than telling the World War II story, we also want to honor the World War II veterans. When we get a, a crew member or a C-47 pilot or someone that flew on DC-3s in World War II, it's that much more special because it's something they did. It's personal to them. It's, it's near and dear to their heart. And they get to go sit in it one more time and get to hear it, get to see it. And uh, watching the expression on their faces as they walk on this thing and, and get to sit in their seat again, they're right there again. It's it's 80 years ago, you know, and they're 19 or 20 years old and like that, you know, and the stuff that comes back to them and that they say and tell us about, it's, you gotta wonder how many decades that memory sat with cobwebs on it. And this airplane was the, the key to unlocking that, that drawer. It just makes it that much more meaningful that we have their signature in the airplane on the side of the cabin now. And, and we got that documented hopefully for all time. But the airplane's doing its job and it's you know one last time going out and uh, saying thank you and, and uh, giving them an opportunity to see it one more time. So it's really special.